1965 release of Bob Dylan's Bringing It All Back Home and a subsequent electric performance at the Newport Folk Festival had kicked over the old order as Dylan stepped out of the folk music frame and set about reinventing rock and roll. Before he decided to go into rock and roll, he was leaving this protest bag, as we call it. He was chafing against the old left, wanting him to be a spokesperson for the young and the new left and continually do songs like Blowing in the Wind, Oxford Town, Hard Rain's Gonna Fall. He was already leaving that bag and he's thinking electricity, drums, bass, loud guitars. He moves towards that sort of sound with bringing it all back home, but it is on Highway 61 Revisited where there's almost a maniacal, not just rockabilly, but punk rock energy fused with Dylan's impressionistic lyrics. And we'd never had that in, in, in rock and roll before. Once upon a time you dressed so fine Threw the bumps of dime in your prime Then you You know, here is Bob Dylan with a hit single and a six or seven minute hit single. You know, there was a sense in, in terms of what that song was about, how it was delivered, that created tremendous new possibilities in rock and roll. And it had a huge impact. It had a huge impact on everyone. Suddenly it seemed like there were no more folk musicians. And then on the rock and roll end of things, he created new possibilities because of this kind of subject matter that songs could address, the type of songs that could be written, the length of the songs that could be written. There is no way to overstate its significance. I mean, just whatever superlative you want to throw in there, you're perfectly entitled to do that. It couldn't have been bigger or more important. Meanwhile, the Hawks, now called Levon and the Hawks in deference to Helm's seniority, were working as a roaming rhythm and blues bar band. With Like a Rolling Stone riding high in the charts, Dylan had been looking for an electric group to back him for some upcoming shows, and the Hawks' name had appeared on his radar. The reputation of the Hawks, of Levon and the Hawks, had spread, maybe not like wildfire, but word had gotten around he was looking for a band that he could just bolt onto what he did, take with him on the road. When Dylan got the Hawks, it was really through the strength of the R&B sound, the 40 Days, the Who Do You Love, Robbie's Blues was one of the great bluesy instrumentals. And of course, Levon Helm and the guys said initially they didn't really know who Bob Dylan was, that they had to somewhat be convinced. And I know that's very hard for people to believe today that they didn't know who Bob Dylan was. But I, I can see it. They might have heard him, but he was in a different world from theirs. The, the Hawks' world of popular music was very African-American R&B. It was not based on Top 40 radio. Robbie and Levin came up to New York City to meet with uh, Grossman and, and ultimately with Dylan. And Dylan liked what he heard or what he heard about them. And so initially it was Robbie on Le and Levon playing behind Bob at two very you know, famous shows. And then that led to a, a kind of full scale tour um, uh, with the Hawks now as Bob's official backing band. The Hawks as an ensemble were never short of cojones. They were never short of uh, testosterone. They were a ballsy bunch. And they lobbied hard for you've hired us, now hire everybody, or maybe we'll go. With Dylan planning a lengthy world tour, Hellman Robertson insisted that the Hawks would either join him as a full band or they wouldn't join at all. It was a stipulation, however, that quickly became redundant. Sections of his audience remained dissatisfied with an electric Dylan, and the early shows were marred by booing from the crowd. It pushed Levon Helm too far. Already uninspired by the music, and skeptical about the wisdom of playing backup, Helm quit the band. Levon, you've got to remember, he was the leader of the band after Ronnie Hawkins. They had, by ensemble agreement, left Ronnie Hawkins and installed the great Arkansas drummer, Levon Helm, as the front man, the, the, the nominal front man, and the name of the band was now Levon and the Hawks, and as he did most of the lead vocals on stage. They did let Richard Manuel sing some ballads, and now, Mr. Helm's thinking, and I say quite rightly, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
we just backed up this guy for years. We gave it a small shot as our own self, and now we're going to back up another guy, and I'm back to just playing the drums. Following Helm's departure, Albert Grossman, Dylan's erstwhile manager, put in a call to L.A. drummer Mickey Jones. As a seasoned rock and roller, Jones had a ferocity to his playing that would push the Hawks' sound up another notch, and his recruitment to the tour suggested that Dylan had no intention of compromising with his public. Albert Grossman called me. So he gets on the phone, he said, Mickey, Al Grossman. I said, well, hi, Al, who are you? He said, well, I'm calling you because I'm Bob Dylan's manager, and Bob Dylan wants you to play drums for him. I said, oh, are we doing a recording session? What is the... He said, Bob's going to go electric. He has finally made a decision. He wants to play electric. He wants to do an electric world tour. And he wants you as the drummer. And he has found some kids in Toronto that he wants to hire uh, as the rest of the group. But uh, that deal is not done yet. We're, we want to confirm you, and then we'll confirm the group. Levon Helms drum, he's got that pizzazz and swings. And when they shifted to Mickey Jones, it had a lot more of the uh, reverberated <laughs> cathedral door <laughs> shutting coming off the kick drum. Levon doesn't have that. He called me a clubber. He thought I played too loud and I played too aggressive. But I did play aggressive, and there were times I played loud, and I'm proud of it. When uh, Mickey Jones gets up to the, the, the drums, it, it really gives it a certain punch which, to use today's cliche, puts it in your face to many of the folk crowd that came to see Dylan in 65, 66 and thought, what the heck? And what the folk crowd found was an artist transformed. The process, however, was far from straightforward. Dylan had to completely reimagine his sound, as well as become acquainted with the demands of playing in a band. We were learning to play those songs, but in a different way with a different arrangement because this is what Bob saw electric. Dylan had been a troubadour for a long time and he had a troubadour's lack of discipline when he played. He would play a 16 bar blues and like John Lee Hooker he might go into a 17th bar. He would play say a 12 bar piece and after four bars or eight bars stick in an extra half bar. Well if you start playing with a band that can really ruin things. Most people can't follow a singer that does that. But because Ronnie Hawkins had done dance routines on the lip of the bar in Canadian taverns uh, in 62, 63, 64, and they had to follow him in those days, the early 60s, the Hawks knew how to stretch. It's all playing together and, and just feeding like one. The band, in my opinion, they got where they could just add lib with Bob Dylan. And Bob Dylan could go anywhere and they could just follow him right in, you know. They were that, they were that good at uh, getting things down getting the music in, in, in a row. I think what the Hawks brought to Dylan that, that even though he'd worked with great electric session musicians before, he hadn't had, which was a real live presence and raucous kind of R&B live feel. I don't think he'd experienced that or felt that kind of power behind him before. The booing that had been heard at Dylan's first performances with the Hawks became a nightly ritual during the 66 tour. Though he persevered, it was clear that Dylan and his audience were now in open conflict over the electric sound, with many seeking every opportunity to heckle and criticize the band. I thought he just couldn't improve if he tried. Then the next thing that happened was he went really commercial with this backing group. And I didn't like that very much. He's changed from what he was. He's not the same as what he was at first. They had heard Bob Dylan at his best, and now they were hearing Bob Dylan in a setting that they didn't want. They loved acoustic. They did, they knew every word, they sang along, they mouthed their lips along. They felt like they, they were being attacked by Bob and the electric set. It was not about were we playing loud, it was not about the songs we were playing, it was about the electric set. 
I think he obviously reached a new audience with, uh, with the new um, hip beat persona. Um, obviously left the folk audience, uh, or the majority of them, behind. Um, and the public, I don't think, knew how to react to it. I think they were... I mean, the, the stories of the, the booing at the 66 concerts was in some ways bizarre, because the public had already had one and a half electric albums from Bob Dylan. So they were going to see a guy that, if they were fans of, had been listening to the music of, uh, you know, you have to wonder why would they boo when he came out as, as a guy with a backing band playing electric? Because he, he was already doing that on record and had been for some time. These are all protest songs now, come on. It's not British music, it's American music, now come on. Bob and I and the rest of the group would get together with Richard Alderson, get the Nagra tape up there in the hotel after the show. And when the booing would start, we just, we kind of laughed at it, you know? It was no big deal. We didn't care if they booed or not. And as the tour progressed, the booing got louder, got worse. Don't boo me anymore. Don't boo me. God, that booing, I can't stand it. <laughs> Oh my God! It's hard to get in tune when they're booing. You know? Yeah, I can't get in tune at all when they're booing. I can't, I can't, uh, it, it, I can't uh, hear anything. I don't even want to get in tune. <laughs> I think word of mouth of the tour started to spread to the cities that we were on our way to, and they were prepared to outdo the last city. As the band prepared to perform like a Rolling Stone, a voice from the crowd spat the insult Judas towards the stage. There he is. Back from the grave. I don't believe you. The third in the trilogy of Dylan's mid-60s records was released. An epic double album, Blonde on Blonde, built on the aesthetic pioneered with Bringing It All Back Home and Highway 61. But there had been an important difference in its recording. During exploratory sessions, Dylan had concluded that the Hawks were not yet ready to carry a studio record. And though Robbie Robertson was retained on guitar, he travelled to Nashville, the home of country music, to work with the local session musicians. It was yet another iconoclastic salvo from Dylan. Given his status among the new left, the very constituency that he had disturbed by going electric, recording in the heartland of conservative America was a bold and unheard of cultural leap. It was not like somebody like Bob Dylan was going to be welcomed in Nashville with open arms. You know, this was, this was really crossing a line. There was no conversation between rock and roll and country music going on then. So using these country musicians on what is a rock and roll record was a kind of bold aesthetic step for Dylan that, once again, no one even noted at the time. I mean, it, its importance only became clear later on. I think he was excited to be here. He was a little apprehensive at first, wondering how, oh, how are these Nashville guys going to take me? But I think he, right away, everything was great. For the way we record in Nashville, the time spent on Bon and Bon was, for us, was like an eternity. It was like 13 sessions. Most Nashville artists at that time would record a whole album in three sessions. You know, I mean, it's just the way it was. And for us, this was so unusual. It, and what really got it started was the first day. We were booked at 2 p.m. His flight was late. He showed up at 6 and said, I'm not finished writing yet. Hang loose. And we started recording at 4 a.m. the next morning. And that was a 14-minute ballad, Sad Eyed Lady of the Lowlands. <laughs> and it was one of those deals, please don't let me make a mistake, you know. <laughs> 